Excellent. Welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Andy Russell. I work as uh, part of the comms team at, at Spinal Research. Um, welcome to the, the first kind of get to know you spinal session, uh, spinal research session for the year. I think we've got quite a few people. Um, it should be a really, really good session. What, one thing I would say from a housekeeping perspective, um, if everyone can try and put their, their um, phones on mute or their devices on mute, um, it just stops any inter you know, interference. Um, and there will be opportunities to speak in terms of like Q&A um, at the end. So um, if, if you can do that, be, that would be great. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I've got a few slides in terms of PowerPoint, but I promise you it's not going to be uh, death by PowerPoint, hopefully. Um, and we'll just run through this. The other thing to mention was that um, the session is being recorded. Um, and so if you have got an aversion to you know, being on the camera, um, please turn the camera off so you know people um, won't be able to see you. Um, so just what, thought I would mention that. Um, we are just gonna have a quick look at the agenda. So um, I'm gonna talk very briefly, just a couple of slides as a reminder to, um, to everyone who we are in terms of spinal research. Um, outline some of the, the goals that we've got and what we're trying to achieve. Um, and then this session in particular is around upper limb restoration. So um, we, we do a lot of our funding and our focus is around uh, functional restoration. Um, and this one is, is focused specifically on upper limb. So um, we were going to be joined by Dr. S Dr. Sarah Astill and Antonio, who's here today, from the University of Leeds. Unfortunately, Sarah has um, had a, medic, a, a family emergency actually um, last minute. So Antonio is stepping into the breach. So um, he's taken on the, the lion's share of the, pre of the presentation. Um, so kudos to you, Antonio, it's really appreciated. Um, we will have probably an extended Q&A now. Um, obviously Antonio knows his area of research very well and his has an overview of the landscape of research, but um, yeah, be mindful that he might be able, might not be able to answer every single question about every single research that's taking place um, across the planet. So, um, but it's it's good to have that Q and A, and we'll try and finish at seven because I know sometimes it's uh, people have got things to do and um, other commitments. So, just a quick reminder of of who we are. We focus specifically on. Um, the restoration and repair of the spinal cord. So I know that there's obviously quite a few different um, spinal charities out there, um, all of whom do a very good job. Um, but we, just to, to avoid any confusion, we, we don't look after things like the day-to-day -day kind of care needs of people with um, spinal cord injury. So um, there are other charities that look at you know, employment opportunities, housing opportunities. We're very much focused on that long-term vision um, of curing paralysis. Um, and on that journey, as I mentioned before, we're very conscious that there is incremental steps that will make life-changing differences to, to our community. So um, even though the, the long-term vision is around that, that, that final cure, um, there's definitely some, uh, some improvements that we feel can be made through research and treatment on that particular journey. So we were um, founded back in the 1980s. That means that we've been funding and working in this field for around 40 years now, um, which seems quite a long time, but it's been a hell of a lot of progress that's been made um, during that time. So understanding how the biology of the spinal cord works and ultimately what, what it takes to repair it. Um, I think I've got a a couple of notes here that when we first, obviously 40 years ago, there was only a, a handful of um, research institutions and studies that were going into um, spinal cord injury. Um, I think now there's over 150 active trials and there's hundreds of different um, labs around the world all working towards um, that vision of trying to get the, the spinal cord um, repaired and restored for the long term. Um, and just to reiterate that you know, we do have skin in the game in terms of our commitment to, to what we're trying to achieve. Um, it comes up a little bit sometimes on some of the social chats that 
there's uh, a feeling that the the medical research is in some ways purposely being kept held back or that there's not much there's not commitment from from our side to actually accelerate these treatments and uh myself i've been in, in a, a wheelchair and had an accident over 25 years ago there's a number of our, our team equally that are in that situation um and e even the board as well so just to un underline that commitment that we've got um to really moving uh the research forward as quickly as we can um and on that note we we try and align a lot of the research projects that we do in line with the the priorities of the community um and um that might be bladder and bowel problems, blood pressure problems, um, autonomic function problems. Um, but this session particularly concentrates on upper limb um, and arm movement, which personally is a tetraplegic. It would be a life changing thing for me for any type of improvement um, in this particular area. And so moving forward really to, I suppose, the lion's share of the the presentation. Um, I was going to hand over to Sarah, but unfortunately she is is not here. So Antonio is going to take on uh, the bulk of the duty in terms of the presentation. Um, and I will stop sharing right now. And Antonio, are you able to, to pick the ball up from here? Of course. I'm going to go on and share my screen and start with Sarah's presentation. Can you all hear me? Yep. I can hear you, yep. Perfect. We can't see your screen at the moment, that's it. Okay. So obviously not Sarah still, but I will start anyway with what's gonna what was gonna be a presentation. First of all, again, thanks Andy for, for the nice introduction. Thank you also for inviting both of us to to give this talk. It's very important for us to to feel part of the community and to to get to know what you think about what we are doing, to get feedback from you. I also see some familiar names and faces in the chat. So, you know, it's always, always nice to see that people, you know, are interested in what we do. So I will start with uh, just an overview of what Sarah was going to talk about. Sarah Hastil is an associate professor at the University of Leeds in motor control. So uh, she's been now working in the spinal cord injury field for the last good 10 years. And uh, the first thing we want to touch is obviously an overview of the spinal cord and uh, what exactly is uh, spinal cord injury, what exactly is, uh, uh, which kind of segments are comprised of the spinal cord. So. Yeah, you can see an overview, obviously, uh, I, I guess you're all familiar with the segments. So different segments of the spinal cord control different muscles and uh, different functions as well. Obviously, you have the cervical level, which is the higher level, starts from C2 to C8. The very first uh, vertebrae, the very first segments control function like breathing, movement of the neck, heart rate, circadian rhythm. So uh, going further down the, the cervical spinal cord, we have the control of the upper limbs, which is what we will focus on on this session today. So obviously keep going down, you have thoracic, lumbar and sacral regions. And uh, the segments we will be mostly focusing on the one going from C2 to, C7, to, to C8 to T1. And simply because as I said, those are the part of the spinal cord for which there are the neurons that control movements in the extreme, in the upper extremities, in the forearms. So why, why the upper limb? I think this is a nice introductory slide. Of, this is from Sarah, but I, I, I get where she's coming from, and I share obviously her interest in the upper limb rehabilitation. This is a study now, twenty years old, that was kind of gathering the priority for rehabilitation from cervical, for people with cervical spinal cord injury. And as you can see that there were a series of items like uh, some then, then handy mentioned, like uh, for example, bladder, and bowel, uh, chronic pain as well, sexual function, but the greatest majority of the, uh, of the people living with spinal cord injury that were asked, they rate increase or changes in uh, upper limb 
function as their main priority for rehabilitation. So uh, this is why this is how Sarah and I what came to the realization that there is a lot of good work being done in the lower limb because this is where the field kind of started in terms of rehabilitation or neuro rehabilitation, and we are just starting to get there for the for the upper limb. Uh, just an overview of what we do here at the University of Leeds at the Faculty of Biological Sciences. We focus on uh, uh, upper limb tasks. So we use techniques like here you can see on the left, top on the top left uh, kinematics. So we use motion capture. We uh, place sensor on the skin of participants to check, to see their movements while they complete, for example, uh, tasks, uh, all sorts of tasks really, to see if there is something in particular, some muscles in particular that we should be focusing on for the scientific, but also for the rehabilitation part. And here down, you can see uh, the picture on the bottom is about electromyography, which is a technique we use to record activity from muscles. So kind of the range of, I guess, studies we've been conducting over the years. The, the picture on the top here is brain stimulation, which is also uh, part of, the, of, of my talk later. And I'm gonna give more details about what brain stimulation here. I guess most of you are familiar with nerve stimulation, peripheral nerve stimulation. We also do uh, H-reflex for both uh, clinical, but mainly scientific studies, and we do uh, arm cycling and uh, arm cycling uh, paired with electrical stimulation. Those are the, the say, most recent studies we'll be involved in. There's uh, one, one particular, let's say, field in which uh, Sarah is possibly one of the, uh, of the best researchers in the world, which is about biomanual coordination. So uh, the ability of humans to, to complete activities with the hands, but with both hands at the same time. So if you think about our, our daily life, there's a lot of activity in which you need to you to coordinate both hands. So uh, this is actually before I came to lead. So I, I, I wasn't involved in the study, but uh, what what Sarah and uh, her colleagues did was they recruited 18 uh, people living with spinal cord injury, with cervical spinal cord injury from uh, Wakefield, and uh, 18 people, 18 uh, older adults, healthy older adults, and 18 uh, younger adults, and they were trying to compare uh, the movements produced by people. And the movements were uh, grasping objects and moving them as far as possible. So here, what you can see, those trajectories are the, uh, the, the force over time and the velocity that, that the movement uh, gets over time. So what you can get from this particular graph is that the red lines represent people uh, with healthy participants and the, the black line represent people living with a spinal cord injury. So uh, first of all, as you can see, there is less velocity. So movements are less smooth, are slower, but also, and this is the first paper to the first study to show that what we can see is that when people with a spinal cord injury, they uh, developed their, their strong too early and then they are not; they don't have a lot of coordination in both hands. So you can see the peak comes earlier, percentage of uh, of movement. So uh, in terms of synchrony, so what I said before that the two limbs, the two hands, need to be coordinated together to perform movements. When we compare uh, here, you can see people with cervical spinal cord injury, the black bars, and also you can see the younger adults and the older adults. When we compare spinal cord injury with this other group, we can see that uh, movement onset, so at the beginning of the movement, at the time of maximal velocity and at the end of the movement, all through all that, the hands are less synchronous compared to healthy adults, older adults, and to young adults. What this means is that one arm is either slower or faster than the other, so that the movement does not come as uh, natural exactly at the same time. So what 
the take home mess message from the studies that people with spinal cord injury produce movement that last longer, are less smooth, and they the, the, the celebrative phase, which is the latter phase, so when the object is being released is longer in people living with spinal cord injury. These seem to be two, as I said, two less synchronous um, movements, less synchronous uh, activities. There seems to be, a, a, what our hypothesis is, is that because of the lack of uh, sensations from the skin, people with spinal cord injury, with cervical spinal cord injury, they uh, are less aware over time of where an object is. So they don't know exactly where it is in space. So they need to be slower. They need to be more careful because they don't have what's the visual feedback and the sensory feedback from the particular, from an object. So this is the, to give you a flavor of the kind of study that we do in, uh, in spinal cord injury that Sarah uh, has done in spinal cord injury. In terms of uh, uh, kind of rehabilitation method uh, we, we are interested in, we are using uh, by manual therapy. So we know that, uh, as I said, uh, both the use of both hands is important. It is important to stimulate activity even the, in the more impaired uh, harm after uh, the acute phase of a spinal cord injury. So uh, this by manual training uh, is more effective at improving arm and end function compared to only focusing on one arm at a time. And this is even more true when we combine by manual training with stimulation. So when we use electricity to stimulate nerves of muscle, while people also do by manual training. Here you can see example of exercise, like finger isolation, grasp, grasp with rotation, pinch, pinch with rotation. So uh, this slide really uh, summarize what we've been talking about, but also leads the way to what I, I will be talking about, which is uh, we know that the motor system has a capacity to adapt. You have all experienced that after the injury, you have all, all experienced that in your life. Over time, we uh, the system, the central nervous system adapts in response to external stimuli. We have to be able to use this adaptation in order to enhance rehabilitation. And this rehabilitation, this rehabilitation also will give us what we need in terms of uh, uh, neural substrate. So we give us the right, uh, let's say, uh, baseline to have recovery of and of arm and end function. And we, Sarah handed the slides with the neuromodulatory approach. So the use of external stimulation to induce and promote this uh, neural plasticity. So these changes in the motor system, which then can be used in combination with uh, task practice or with movements to again, make sure that the rehabilitation is more effective. Okay. I will go straight into mine. It kind of leads intuitively into that. So, okay, I don't have to present myself again, at least. So um, I, I'm gonna move to uh, add to details about the last um, investigational trial that we conducted here at the University of Leeds. So I, I hope that from the previous presentation, uh, uh, first of all, it was clear the importance of doing exercise for upper limb rehabilitation, but also this uh, potential promising uh, use of external stimulation, electrical stimulation in our particular case to enhance rehabilitation after injury. And uh, the study I, be, I will be talking about is about transcutaneous electrical stimulation for recovery of upper limb function after cervical spinal cord injury. Obviously, I am Antonio. I am a research fellow here at the University of Leeds. And I, um, I want to start with giving you a bit of background of who I am. Well, I, I have a background in psychology. I am from Italy. I studied psychology in Italy. Uh, then for my research master, I moved to the Netherlands to study cognitive neuroscience. So I moved towards the neuroscience field, let's say. And then as part of my research internship, I, I went to Dublin, to Ireland for a year to again do research about 
uh, brain simulation. I will be discussing it in a second. And finally, the last eight years I've been first a PhD student and then the last four years a research fellow, again, working in the lab of uh, Dr. Sarah Hastil. Now, this is about, about me, but why spinal cord injury or rather how, do I, how did I uh, ended up working on spinal cord injury. Uh, I I think that I feel that everything started when I was completing my internship in Dublin because it, it was about 2015. And uh, it was a, a very interesting time for neuroscience research. I was working on something that is called period associated stimulation. So on the possibility of um, inducing plasticity in the in the brain with stimulation and at the same time this uh, very good paper from uh, university hospital helsinki so from a finland group came out in which they were able to prove that if you use uh, a technique which is called period associative stimulation you can restore voluntary control over paralyzed muscle in people with, living with spinal cord injury patients I have uh, also have the reference for this paper at the very hand. So if you're not familiar with it, my, my suggestion is to go and take a look at that, even just for the very cool videos showing recovery in these patients, participants. So also uh, uh, at that time and for the previous almost 10 years, I was working as a, I was volunteering actually for uh, APUSB, which is the Italian Association of Spina Bifida. So I, I was really you know, passionate about, uh, let's say, working with, uh, with people with, um, uh, who had, uh, for example, in this particular case, Spina Bifida. So I wanted to kind of uh, uh, match together my two great interests of neuroscience and helping people living with a disability. And luckily enough, there was a PhD scholarship in Leeds uh, investigating the effect of non-invasive stimulation in spinal cord injury. So I, since 2016, have been working in Leeds with Dr. Assin and with Professor Ronaldo Ichiyama. So what's my area of expertise? I mentioned neural plasticity, also Sarah mentioned it. What does it really mean? I always like to show people and students these short videos to start with. So what here you can see are two neurons. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but there are two neurons that they are not, at the moment, they're not communicating with each other, but what they're trying to do is there is axons sprouting, that's how they're called. Over time, they build connection and there's gonna be shared information between these two neurons. So uh, this process, which we are now seeing at the, at the micro level, it's happening continuously throughout our, throughout our life. So it is what's making us learn new things. It's uh, what happens when we make new memories. It's constantly going on in our brain. So neuroplasticity is defined as the ability of the nervous system to change in response to stimuli. Now, importantly, this stimuli can be intrinsic. So for example, uh, thinking about something or moving or exercising, but they can also be extrinsic. What does it mean? It means that they don't have to come only uh, from, from your home body, but you can also supplement that, augment that with external uh, stimulation. And this is really what I was interested with at the very, uh, the very start of my academic career. And the paper I published, uh, Trinity College Dublin uh, as part of my internship was indeed showing that you can induce this plasticity in the brain just by using external stimulation. So participants literally have to do nothing, but you can just use electricity or in this particular case, magnetic fields to make their brain more excitable over time. So the technique I'm using here is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And it's what I'm gonna be talking about I want to give you just a bit of a background of what we do in terms of the techniques. I'll try to be uh, to keep it simplistic. Obviously, you know, if there are further questions or doubts, we can always tackle them in the Q and A at the end. So, brain stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, here you can see the, the the machine we use in Leeds is a technique by which we deliver magnetic pulses to the brain. 
it's non-invasive, it's non-painful. The people, I know a few people probably, yeah, I know from people from reading the names have tried it of you. It's uh, literally like if someone is, you know, is touching your, your scalp, is touching your brain, it's not painful. But what it does is, is uh, inducing electricity in the brain and this electricity travels to the spinal cord and then makes the muscles move. Now we use them to check the integrity of our system. So uh, obviously if there is a higher response from this stimulation, it means that the pathway that goes from the brain to the muscle is active and uh, is working properly. So this technique is used, for example, for diagnosis, can be used also for checking, uh, you know, uh, myelopathy, for checking uh, Sorts of, any sorts of uh, uh, disease, neuronal uh, neuronal uh, changes in the motor system. And just to to let you see what I'm talking about, now I'm simulating the brain of this particular participant, and here you see movements of the hands. So what this does is inducing these movements. Obviously, it's not something you can control. So. Possibly the only the only annoying thing is the lack of control when you're being a participant, but it's not painful at all. And here you can see also uh, the sensors on the skin. So those are electromyography sensors. As I said before, they are attached to the skin and what they do is they record electrical activity, activity from muscles. So, we touched on brain stimulation. However, there is a more recent technique which has been developed we are really talking about the last 10 years we are starting to see more and more spinal stimulation coming on so spinal stimulation in particular the technique we use is called transcutaneous electrical stimulation is again a non-invasive technique and uh, the aim is to promote plasticity but this time is targeting directly the spinal cord so we don't have to pass through the brain to the brain we can activate the spinal cord directly and it's been, it's been so far uh, piloted and tested uh, across all segments of the spinal cord. Obviously, according to the to the electricity location, you will get different effects. So if you target the lumbar segments, you will possibly modulate urinary functions. There's quite a lot already of uh, data available about the effect on uh, walking on gait. So if you have thoracic stimulation, during gait or during gait rehabilitation, during physiotherapy, it is also effective in improving your uh, your working. And finally, on the cervical level, which is what we are doing for recovery of upper limb, this is um, relatively new and uh, less explored than the other uh, area. And this is also why we wanted to try and test this new technique. There have been uh, promising results. This is a study from three years ago from Washington, so from a group in America of colleagues. And they were able to show that if you do use the spinal cord stimulator, so if you stimulate the spinal cord while people do, for example, physiotherapy or exercise, uh, this restores arm and end function in people living with spinal cord injury. They were able to show that in both complete and incomplete uh, participants. I just go rapidly through the, to the result. So what they did is they had people coming in and just measuring their grip strength. So they asked them to grasp something and they measure how, how strong their, their, their grasp was. And then they started training only training, just repeating exercise. And as soon as they turn the stimulator on, so they started with spinal stimulation, yeah, you can see a huge effect of stimulation. So people got stronger with stimulation on. If then you take the stimulation off, people are still stronger than at the very beginning. And what's even most impo more important is that at follow-up, which is for 24 weeks, six months after the end of the last session, these participants were still stronger than at the beginning. So this is, those were for us very promising results. And we were starting with these results. We obviously tried to replicate that, but we also wanted to uh, 
to increase, to augment the results and to have something else on it. So we designed this investigational trial, which aimed at combining task practice with spinal stimulation. And uh, the aims of our study were, first of all, to measure the effect of stimulation combined with task practice on upper limb functions. We also had that measure of quality of life and independence. So we wanted to see if we were also doing something uh, something possibly beneficial to the quality of life of independence of our participants. Also, which is completely mi missing right now from the literature and from, from the science we know, uh, we want to understand what's going on at the neurophysiology. So what's going on in the brain, what's going on in the spinal cord when we stimulate. And I will explain later the discussion why we think this is important also to guide future rehabilitation. And finally, we wanted to establish a protocol to use TCS, to use stimulation in uh, in a participant and to tailor, so to use um, settings that are specific to each participant. So this is the study we designed. It's quite a convoluted design, but uh, guide you, to guide you through, people started and they came in for two weeks. At the very first two weeks, we assessed their uh, upper limb function, their quality of life, their independence, and we also assessed uh, their brain and their spinal excitability. So how responsive the brain and the spinal cord were. Then the participants were divided into two groups. One group started with one month of upper limb therapy, and then they did one month of upper limb therapy with the stimulation. The other group instead started directly with one month of therapy with the stimulation on. And then they did one month with only the upper limb therapy. I hope this is clear. If not, uh, there, will be, uh, there will be further explanation with the results. Then the, after these two months of uh, total intervention, they we, we reassess, first of all, their uh, uh, upper limb function, but also we now check for evidence of brain plasticity and spinal plasticity. And finally, three months after the last session, so in these three months, people don't do anything, they don't do any stimulation, they come back and we reassess everything to check for any long lasting effect. So brief summary. So uh, the one month of task practice and task practice with stimulation was three times per week. And then, as I said, they had to come one more week after three months. So overall, we're talking about 32 sessions over five months. So it's quite a, a big time, uh, time commitment. And uh, obviously, we have to decide which kind of participant we could include in our study. And we wanted to have uh, people with at least one year after injury. So at the chronic stage, people uh, between 80 and uh, 18 and 80 years, uh, because we were trying to measure, uh, to assess improvements in end function, we were looking for participants that had difficulty in completing activities of daily living. And uh, obviously, and this is quite a common uh, inclusion criteria, someone that does, does not have any uh, concurrent disease or something else which you know might uh, preclude their participation to the study. And finally, what turned out to be the hardest criteria of all, the ability to attend three sessions of weekly experimental session over the course of, four, of eight weeks. So uh, this is how the recruitment went of uh, across Slightly less than two years, we had 28 people contacting us. We excluded three for uh, not meeting the criteria. Two were a uh, complete spinal cord injury participant, and one was injured in just a few months before, before they contacted us. And now the negative is that 19 people could not participate because of either time or financial commitment or having to come to the University of Leeds, which left with six participant and enrolled, and one decided to drop out after the first session. But the positive is that all our participants completed all the 32 sessions. So this is called adhesion rate in, in science, and uh, is a measure of how likely the, the participant, but also at a later stage, the patient it is to engage in something. So we, we did definitely did something 
right in that sense because people were willing to come back and back and back again and they were they were all very reliable i must say those are the uh, characteristic of our participant all females not not because we wanted to but just happens yeah you can see a whole range of uh, of years post injury from 2 to 30 uh, aas level c and d so most of them with some spare functionality in the upper limbs and the injury that ranges from C2 to C8. As I said, when they arrive, the first thing we do is a behavioral assessment. So we measure, uh, we use a battery of tasks, which is called GRASP, which is uh, measuring sensation, strength, and prehension. So ability to complete tasks. Here you can see two examples. So for example, pouring water from a bottle to a glass or inserting coins into a, a small hole. And then we participant completed a quality of life questionnaire and a independence questionnaire. So asking how independent are you in completing this particular, this particular daily task. Finally, what we did is we developed this uh, manipulanda, so this object uh, which have a force measure so when you grasp them, it will, they will tell you how strong is your grip. So they will, t they will tell you a number which we can take as a preference of how strong your grip is. And we ask people to perform a low grip task. And again, to ask, we ask them to move this object as far away as possible with their hands. From the neural part, uh, as I said before, we use uh, we use brain stimulation and uh, spinal stimulation. So we were interested in brain plasticity and spinal plasticity, and we were recording from four muscles, from uh, the bicep, from uh, muscle in the forearm, up until the thumb muscle using this technique, which is called electromyography. Finally, what did they do? So task practice was uh, consisted of six uh, exercises, independent finger movement, in which they had to move their fingers according to what we asked them to do. To do. Uh, precision grip, so uh, completing shape, uh, drawing shapes, pinch with object, picking up, for example, pegs and then placing them on uh, cardboard. Power grip, so using these elastic bands. Wrist extension and flexion using the therapeutic, so we were also assessing the range of motion while doing extension and frame flexion. And finally, wall hard movement. So we had bottles and uh, uh, participated to raise them above their hand and keep them and then put them back in place. And uh, all these tasks were designed to be, uh, first of all, easy at the beginning so that everyone could engage, but on the other side, we could increment difficulties. So for example, we could make the bottles uh, heavier by adding stones in it. We could make the elastic bands stronger and stronger and so on and so forth. Five minutes each for a total of 30 minutes. This is what happened when they only have task practice. However, then there will be a month in which they have task practice together with spinal stimulation. And on these particular days, Task practice is the same, but in addition, we stimulate the spinal cord and we do 30 minutes of simulation. We use what's called a bridge approach. What it means is that you stimulate below and above the lesion so that you try to create almost a recurrent uh, link, recurrent activity uh, over the lesion area. We also decided according to each individual injury, where to put the electro. What that means is that because we tend to have uh, people with a more, more impaired uh, harm than the other, we would preferentially target this. For example, imagine if you cannot use the left harm as well, we would put the electrodes more to the left side and would also we would, uh, we would choose the intensity according to uh, the individual uh, uh, the, the person specifics. For example, uh, if it makes your arm, uh, your arm muscle move, we will choose that particular location and intensity. This procedure, this procedure is called TCS mapping, and it's very important to make sure that we are giving every single participant the uh, intervention that is better matched to their particular injury.
and also they we ask them to to rate their pain their tolerance uh, from 0 to 10 while we deliver stimulation moving on to the results so starting with the the good results so we saw that uh, after one month of practice uh, just just exercise people were better in terms of function but they were even better when we had simulation on so here you can see those spider plots they have made of quality of life independence function sensation and strength i hope you it is clear that the red would be when they first come into the lab and then the green which is the biggest for example in this graph the left would be after they had the stimulation so strength of participant sensation and function increase after the stimulation uh, in both group one and group two remember group two and group one they did the same thing but the order was different so one started with only exercise and the other started with exercise with the stimulation so take home message is that there were significant improvement in function. And then three months after, here you would see the violet line. Three months after these improvements were still there, even while they started to reverse, they are still better than when they first came into our lab. Moving on in terms of quality of life of independence. So there should be another graph here. So, uh, independence and quality of life did not change unfortunately after any of our intervention there seems to be something going on with independence of participant reporting a bit more but likely it wasn't strong enough to really have a change uh, an effect an effect on the on the independence of participants and now moving to the neural results i'm going to explain this uh, graph. So what we did is we simulated the brain at increasing intensities of stimulation. Now, if you increase and increase and increase, you what it means is that you will activate more and more neurons or neurons that are uh, further away or that are uh, deeper or they are less usually less active. So we simulate through these intensities with uh, brain stimulation. And what we saw is that after uh, practice, so only practice without stimulation, there was brain plasticity going on. So something was going on in the brain, which means that just by doing the exercise, we can induce this plasticity. However, interestingly, three months after, when people came back with the follow-up, there was no brain plasticity going on. Now, the same uh, similar results were found with uh, spinal stimulation and spinal plasticity. Here again, you can see increasing stimulation, which means that you are now trying to activate more and more neurons in the spinal cord, not in the brain. And this time, what we saw is that as soon as you turn on the stimulation, if you had the stimulation, there is an increase in spinal, in spinal plasticity. But exactly like for the brain, three months after, there was no spinal plasticity. And finally, the grasp task. I've been uh, I've been explaining how participants had to produce these movements with both arms at the same time. They had to grasp objects and move them as far as possible. Uh, here you can see an example on the left on a participant at the beginning of the trial. So this particular participant, she had a very strong left arm. In fact, she was producing more strength than what you need to move the object. You, you can see that from the black line. However, the right line, the red line, sorry, which is the right arm, wasn't really able to grasp the object, so you see very little activity. Now, moving on to the right, what happens after one month uh, of spinal stimulation is that, first of all, now the right can produce more activity, but also, which is important, remember, for what I told you before during, the, during Sarah's presentation, that they are now timed together, so there is a some, there is a constant time between the two, so you are able to perform the movements with two hands, the two arms at the same time. And finally, what we did is uh, we conducted semi-structural interviews. So we asked uh, participants about their experience of participating to the trial, what they didn't like, what they would change, and so on and so forth. And the greatest challenge, challenge for Many of them was to commit, as I said before, to these three weekly, two months of session at the University of Leeds. Uh, 
positive side they enjoyed being here they enjoying uh you know getting to know more about research understanding uh, the the scientific side some reported however that the upper limb exercise started to be boring after the first few sessions this is a quote we took from the interviews i really enjoyed the stimulation part because it was cool to see progress even after many years of injury and finally my favorite quote which is i can move my little finger now what do i do with it which is you no know, funny a bit of a funny side but also you know it raises the question of are everything we are doing is everything we are doing really um, important for uh, for daily living and are we really doing uh, targeting exactly what what people want so summarizing uh, we know that stimulation with uh, exercise improve uh, function we know that this improvement were maintained after 3 months we know that what we did had no significant effect on quality of life of independence, unfortunately. Obviously, this was a very short trial. We don't know yet if six months of stimulation would have a different effect, in particular on independence. Uh, and we know that we now know a bit more about the neurophysiology, which is we know that the brain becomes more excitable when you do exercise, but the spinal stimulation is also important because it makes your spinal cord more reactive over time. And finally, we know that TCS is safe, is effective technique, it can be used for upper limb rehabilitation after spinal cord injury. Uh, lesson learned, I would just rapidly move forward. We learned that uh, unfortunately time and financial commitments are still the greatest barrier to participant involvement in research. And uh, we also learned that not everybody will benefit from the stimulation. So it is a discussion that as a field, as a community, soon we will start to have about targeting the stimulation, targeting the intervention, because uh, it depends really on the baseline of the participant and what they want to achieve, whether it will benefit their life over time. It is still difficult, unfortunately, in the UK to reach and communicate with the scientific community, with the spinal cord injury community. Uh, that motor tasks will be interesting and meaningful for the participant. Here I put meaningful because this is one of the directions we want to, to move forward in our future studies. Bright side, spinal stimulation, everybody could tolerate that. Very minor negative effect. Uh, we saw an increase in function, uh, even while it wasn't life-changing increase, we did see something promising after stimulation. And this device we employed is portable, is user-friendly, it's very small. So possibly can be used for home-based rehabilitation in the future. So more in general, there is a growing interest in uh, neurorehabilitation and it's an exciting time to be working on this field because there's a few things that seem to be starting to work. We just have to tailor them. We have to be more precise in what we do, which brings to the future direction. So. Uh, we already tested, this is a paper we just published in uh, um, Healthy Participant and now uh, is, is uh, close to publication in the spinal cord injury community about using motor imagery with spinal stimulation. So imagining to move and using spinal stimulation or uh, intermittent hypoxia. So uh, uh, decreasing and increasing oxygen in, uh, during uh, spinal stimulation, use of virtual reality as well. Those are all very promising approach. And finally, using arm cycling. What do we want to do? And what we think as a group here at the University of Leeds that is the right way forward is, first of all, we need bigger trials, which involves multiple centers. Also to make sure that everyone, independently of whether they are in a particular geographical location in UK, they can participate to the study. We need so to start soon, talk about on base rehabilitation because the greatest barrier is having to do things not at your home. Um, we would like to start using uh, non invasive stimulation at the acute stage. So, uh, you know, uh, ideally the first six months or as soon as possible after the injury because this can be used for diagnosis, but also is the time in which more plasticity is occurring. So, this is where we want to go. Uh, as a, as a group. And finally, we want to have a stratified and approach, a goal-oriented approach to rehabilitation. So we want to use a, a rehabilitation according to what each particular participant wants to achieve. So not only doing the same exercise with everybody, but focus on one particular goal, one particular 
difference that will make a meaning in their life and then decide the stimulation and the intervention according to these particular goals. Just handy with, if you want to keep in touch with us, if you are interested in participating, we also have another study running, uh, which will start soon about gait, uh, not gait rehabilitation, but uh, gait function after spinal cord injury. So I'll leave the, the slides, I'll leave the emails here. They're also gonna be in the recording if you want to, to contact me or Sarah. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank again, uh, uh, Handy and the Spinal Research, and also our collaborators are Wakefield and Sheffield Spinals, who gave us the device, and everybody who was involved into, into the project. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Lo Antonio. It was a tour de force. You had to cover all of uh, Sarah's slides as well, so, so well done. Um, I guess we've got you know 10 minutes left for Q&A, so if people want to ask questions, you know, just unmute themselves yourselves and um, fire away and be brave. The whole point is to be interactive and this is the chance to speak to a real life uh, researcher. And we've got a few others that I think are on the call as well. So, um, you know, feel free to, to chime in and also use the chat as well. I had a couple of questions if no one else has any and it might be, you know, I can see Harvey's on the call and Antonio, uh, sorry, Ronaldo, for example. Um, so tra the transcutaneous stimulation is obviously getting quite a lot of news right now, but that's really the, that's only one type of electrical stimulation. So I just wonder whether the, you know, either Harv or, um, or Ronaldo wanted to talk about some of the other different adaptations and the way electrical stimulation is being applied as well. Hoping one of you will. I can still... I can let Ronaldo take it, given he's an expert on epidural stimulation. Ronaldo, are you willing? Otherwise, I can take it. Feel free, Harvey. <laughs> sure. Um, so, so obviously, there there are a number of approaches um, being undertaken in research groups all around the world to stimulate the spinal cord, to stimulate the brain. Of course, some of you will have seen the news. Uh, a couple of weeks ago from Neuralink and Elon Musk's group, but there's also a number of other groups that are working on lots of different types of technologies to stimulate the brain and the spinal cord for different purposes. And of course, within the spinal cord injury space, there are many of those being applied. And, and uh, you know, Ronaldo and his group at Leeds, um, a number of other groups in the UK are, are, are currently preparing for trials. Um, and of course, international trials going on with various types of spinal stimulators and brain stimulators. We could have a whole session on those, so I won't go through those, but there's obviously a lot of different approaches. And this is one that's very promising and also very importantly, non-invasive, which makes it a little bit easier to apply to our community. And, and that leads me, I guess, to the, the sort of second question around like the status of those technologies, because that's, um, it's been highlighted the the difficulty is getting to trials to to making its different locations, especially for um, you know, tetras and um, getting around that independence thing. So I guess that's quite key, isn't it? That we're perhaps moving now where to a point where we might start seeing things within the community that would add to the research as well, right? So it's um, one thing to think about. Yeah, I mean, obviously we all know that. Uh, no two spinal cord injuries are the same. We're a very diverse group with different abilities um, and we will respond to different technologies and therapies in different ways. So clinical trials and being really smart with our clinical trials and really smart with diagnostics and being really smart with um, every type of other tool that's available to us to be able to make the very best decisions, the best selection um, and the best application of technologies is vital within research and groups all around the world are focusing on these as well as obviously developing good technologies and therapies. I'm stealing your thunder there, Ronaldo and Antonio, if you want to comment. Um, so Antonio, we've got a question from Vivian um, on the chat. So what was the, was there an outcome in terms of the discomfort rating and what was the range of the ampli amplitudes that you used? 
Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Vivian. This is a good good question. I actually hope that you were going to touch on it. Surprisingly, we always stayed in the first half of the visual analog scale. So between zero and five, I think we had the occasional, you know, six, which would consider as some pain, but it, it was well tolerated, you know, uh, nothing that people wouldn't go like, okay, I can do it for long. I can do it for, you know, for 30 minutes if it needs to. And obviously we had as a criteria that we had to stop after eight anyway, eight out of 10. We never reached out of 10. I never had to stop. In terms of current amplitudes, it really, it really ranges. So with the score, with the with the machine we're using right now, we went from 40, 50 as, you know, the, the in terms of continuous, even 20, 25 for some, all the way up to 60 for continuous, 70, it really depends. So we have uh, some guidelines according to the age and the lesion of what the range should be about, but then everyone is different. So to give you just some numbers, I hope this is kind of as well your question. I think uh, there was a couple of other, Molly had a hand up and so, Molly, you've got, the, you've got the ball if you want to run with it. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess my question is specific to the GRASP as being one of the developers of that GRASP measure. Were there any sub, I know your sample is small, but were there any subunits of the GRASP that were of more importance to the patients or aligned with what their goals might be? And the reason I'm asking the question is, small population, no matter whether it's how many participants or how many have, you know, I mean, we're an orphan, we're an orphan, as we call them in Canada, an orphan population spinal cord injury is a neurological po population. And so, so we need precision rehabilitation and the measures that we have that are skim and SF36 and even the grass have many different components to it. And so is there any importance for us as we move forward to be thinking about precision of the measures, as well as what we're actually trying to do with our stimulation and the neurophysiological part of that. Yeah, thanks. This is a good question. And I completely agree with you. So those measures have limitations. So they, they don't really encapsulate what we want to achieve. So they are the most used. And thanks for developing them because the GRASP is a great technique and a great tool, I think. Uh, in terms of what, if I would say, which particular sub subtest was, we saw improvement in was, first of all, the strand one and sensation improved. Now, prehension might have improved in some participant as a consequence of the increase in strength. But that depends again on the baseline. So if they weren't able to, to produce that two newtons at the beginning that you need to perform that particular part of the grasp and now they can, they also become good at the prehension part, at the function part. So I think what spinal stimulation really is, and this is replicated in all studies so far, is helping with that beginning strength thing, which also, asks, which also makes us ask, does anyone need that? Because I also had participants that didn't need that in particular, but they were, you know, they would rather focus on something else, on one particular task, or something more cognitively demanding. So what we want to move forward, forward is, as I said, the, defining the goal and defining the measure with each participant. One other thing that I didn't show here, just because we haven't analyzed the data yet, is we had uh, kinematics data during the task. So we can see uh, where the, 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 not only the force produced, but where the muscles are in, in, uh, in, in space while they do the exercise. So we are more able to say, okay, they got better because now their grasp aperture is more or because they are faster at doing this particular bit. Personally, I think this is where we should move forward in order to, you know, to give a better insight in what's happening. Can I have a supplemental to that last part? Okay, and that is, do you think that there is any potential then to do the stimulation peripherally and couple it with the other two? And the reason that I ask that, because that's one of the protocols that we're using in our in our upper upper limb and clinic that we have in Toronto. And and it seems to me that, and we're doing that with very a couple of really chronic patients who also get other kinds of sensations 
in different parts of their body when we're doing just directly to the muscle itself. Okay. So my point is, is, is there, is there a reason to think about do not just using the EMG to record, but using stimulation of the muscle first and as well as pairing it with the other two. Yes, the, the technique I've been talking about in the first part of the talk, which is uh, something I've been using uh, previously, which is paired associative stimulation. The idea is that it is that you pair two uh, sources of stimulation. Uh, originally, it was thought to be brain paired with the peripheral. So exactly what you mentioned, but this time now trying to uh, combine the, the, the sending part, the part from the brain with the sensation part from the peripheral and the muscle stimulation. I I think there's people in this group starting to work more and to try and pilot TCS or spinal stimulation with the peripheral part. I think that the difficulties there is timing. And we, we are not really talking about timing because this is long stimulation. So it's not precise. And uh, neural activation is a very precise phenomenon. It's at the millisecond level. And instead we give 30 sure. minutes of simulation, just hoping that we, something will come. I think we will get there by manipulating these times, but it will be hard. And to be fair, we still don't know that in the, you know, in the healthy population, we don't, we don't know yet which ones to use. So definitely one way forward, possibly, you know, uh, hard to hard to achieve, but it will, I think it will give us meaningful answer. Absolutely. Okay. Thank I'm sorry, you. I've got a, I've got a, um, I think Barbara had a, a question. I don't think she's been waiting for a little while. So sorry. you've unmuted yourself, I Barbara. It, uh, if you'd like to read it out now, it might be quicker than me explaining. Oh, right. Apologies. I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to juggle the chat at the same time. I put it on the chat. All right. Um, one second. Sorry, I'm like, this is the problem when you're a, You've got limited hand movement. This is I'm a working example of it. Can anyone else see the, the question? Uh, hold on one second. Well, shall I shall I carry on? Yeah, just to, yeah. Yeah, just explain. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm interested in obtaining quantitative measurements for neuroplasticity to improve the acute assessment of spinal damage using patients because currently the assessments that are used are very crude. So I was wondering how soon will the team in Leeds be starting to do the non-invasive um, transcutaneous spinal cord um, assessments? Simple answer, as soon as they let us. <laughs> I don't know if Ronaldo wants to jump in on that, but you know, it is still, if you're talking about the diagnosis, so using using uh, TC, TMS as a measure of uh, yes. uh, pathway spare, yeah. And, and functional MRIs as well. As well, yes. yes. Functional MRI uh, already going on, going on in Leeds, uh, not as precise in terms of the, the exercise we want to do. So yes. we are still not there, but that's also a difficulty we know with uh, availability of the scanner with Yes. You know, financial financial uh, issues of having to you know physically go and rent the scanner from the from the hospital. So not there yet for fMRI for the for TMS as a diagnostic measure for spinal stimulation as a diagnostic measure. It really yeah. depends on how on uh, how easy it will be for us to get access to the uh, acute population. Yeah. So. It's, uh, the, the, I appreciate the, the... that, but there are so many problems with rehabilitation starting accurately at the right time that I think it's important that um, I do try and encourage people to do this research as soon as possible. Yeah, we are all on the same page in that. And to be fair, this year, this because we were discussing that everybody would like to, you know, to work with the participant as soon as possible and to start taking these measures. It's, you know, there are, there are constraints that go uh, beyond the, 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 the scientific community in that. Even just being able to get through, as I said, ethical approval, yeah. many of the techniques, the machines we use are not 
uh, are, some are CA marked, some most of them they are not approved to go into the NHS. So mm. we have all this sort of, you know, in terms of science, we have been there I'm, for the last 10 years at least, in terms of getting there and telling something more meaningful than, you know, AAS score, which we know is not a perfect measure. Yeah. I've seen I've seen the um, studies that have been done on animals through the spinal cord injury, but they have not been taken up by the clinicians um, to start the research on the um, people with spinal cord injury post as soon as post injury as possible. And uh, I do think, you know, the community, we ought to start trying to um, progress quickly because it's been going on for de decades that we don't have accurate assessment post-injury to determine what neuroplasticity, when it starts and when it's um, finished. Can I jump in just for a second? Sorry, Antonio. I yeah. was waiting for, for you. I, I, your point is absolutely brilliantly well put, Barbara. Uh, for From our perspective, from a rehabilitation perspective, we know starting early is better in any of the conditions we look at obviously starting too early like within a few hours is terrible no, but i don't i don't i don't expect it to be done within a few hours yes yeah, no, within reason exactly. and on, on the condition waiting, of the patient waiting a year to start it it's all it, it's too late well it it's is. not too late yeah. but it's a lot more difficult let's put it that way so we are all absolutely on your side we're pursuing this type of, of intervention we want to bring this to the hospitals here but also across the world you should you should feel a little bit uh, good about this that people are looking to that also so it's not just us here pushing this and there are a few studies that i have seen and we, has been approved to actually start early in the hospital still right. so we're getting there keep your hopes up we're, we're gonna get there because i so, 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 i've set okay. up a neuroplasticity group but we haven't got any funding yet so right. getting if i might add to this so getting a idea of motor cortical reorganization and that timing across uh, certain parts of the spinal cord injury population is really critical. And pulling that data and seeing whoever else is actually looking at the cortical reorganization over time is, is absolutely key to me. Um, and we've tried to do that and we've seen some of it, okay. Um, um, early on in the 80s, okay. But I don't see that blossoming enough to help us get into that acute phase. So we- I think we're, um, we're possibly going into uh, a quite a, a, a detailed avenue and um, I'm just conscious it's sort of seven minutes past seven already now. Um, I really appreciate all of the you know, energy everyone's brought to the, the, the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna probably, probably call it now. I think we're gonna, um, Try and keep these conversations going. So my intention is to run one of these perhaps every month on certain uh, functional um, improvements. Um, Ronaldo, your phone will be ringing, so I think you might be up next because I think we'd quite like to do another study on or deep dive onto that the hand and grasp, and then perhaps you know move on to things like uh, the bladder and bowel autonomic functions, um, looking at you know pain, looking at the things that that really matter to our community. So I really, you know, two things I would take out from today is um, one is, you know, the how Ronaldo mentioned about the fact that people can play a role through trials. So the, the numbers that diminish is quite shocking, actually, because when you talk to the spinal cord injury community, everyone wants to get involved. Um, and there seems to be frustration that things aren't moving forward. And I think that's one way from a non-financial perspective that people perhaps can play a role. And try and take uh try and participate and then i guess the other part is that you know we it's it's good to have everyone being pulling in the same direction and feeling perhaps that frustration that we need to move things forward so um you know uh, if we can keep the conversation going um, and all work together i think it'll be um yeah the best for for the research in the, in the end